Good afternoon, colleagues. The first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions. Uh, the first portfolio is COVID-19 recovery and parliamentary business. There's a fair bit of interest across all the portfolios, so the usual appeal for brevity in the questions and um, similar brevity as far as possible in the responses. Uh, any member wishing to ask a supplementary question should press the request to speak buttons during the relevant question. And I call question number one, Claire Baker. And to ask the Scottish Government how it is progressing its COVID recovery strategy commitments to improve financial security for low-income households. Minister Ben McPherson. The Scottish Government is prioritising funding to help household finances across the country. We are taking action to increase financial security for low-income households by, for example, increasing the Scottish Child Payment to £25 per week per eligible child, doubling the Fuel and Security Fund to £20 million, and providing local authorities with additional funding for discretionary housing payments. In total, the Scottish Government has allocated around £3 billion this financial year to contribute towards mitigating the increased cost crisis. Uh, over £1 billion of this support is only available in Scotland, with the remainder being more generous than uh, provided elsewhere in the UK. Claire Baker. Um, I thank the Minister for the response. Um, as he said, the pandemic and the cost of living uh, crisis has exacerbated the situation for low-income households, and last week we had devastating poverty statistics published for Scotland. On the 5th of October 2021, that is when the strategy was published, and a lot of the commitments have been delivered within 18 months, but there are still gaps in delivery around free breakfasts uh, and wraparound childcare, for example. So can I ask the Minister, will there be a re-evaluation of the remaining commitments? Is that going to be brought forward? forward with new timescales and is the strategy still relevant? Minister. I, I would refer the member to recent uh, ministerial statements on both of those aspects. Of course, there is a continued process of work with regard to both uh, wraparound childcare and also school meals, and that is coupled with the £428 million that the Government has allocated to operate all benefits in Scotland uh, that the Scottish Government is responsible for uh, by 10.1%, uh, and of course the £442 million uh, for the Scottish Child Payment to be increased to £25 uh, per week per eligible child, as well as action uh, to tackle the high cost of housing with regard to rents and a continued social housing programme. So, uh, a huge amount of work has been done and uh, more work will need to be done in order to meet those obligations and continue to provide for low-income families in Scotland and lift children out of poverty as a priority for all of us. I'm very supplementary, John Mason. Hey, thank you. Given that inflation is now 10.4 per cent and many families are struggling to pay uh, increasing bills, can the Minister say if the Scottish Government has all the powers it needs to deal with this, or does Westminster need to act as well? Minister. Uh, the Scottish Government position is that the UK Government's budget statement uh, does not fully address the cost of living crisis, nor provide the support that people in Scotland need, and there is more that can be done. Uh, the Scottish Government, as I have alluded to in, in, in some of the policy commitments I have outlined, has been using its limited powers and uh, restrained financial resources to provide more help and ensure people receive the help that they need. Um, although the constraints of the current devolution settlement uh, prevent the Scottish Government from borrowing, uh, and certainly the more that uh, we argue for collectively as a Parliament for borrowing powers, the more that we would be able to do. Thank you. Question two, Audrey Nicholl. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what impact it anticipates that the increase in inflation to 10.4 per cent will have on the delivery of the priority outcomes set out in the COVID recovery strategy. Mr Richard Lockett. The current financial situation, including high levels of inflation, is particularly challenging due to our lack of fiscal powers. And the Scottish Government's prioritised spending, which supports those who need it the most, guided in part by the principles of the COVID recovery strategy. And in 2023-24, Scottish Budget provides funding which helps families, backs businesses and protects the delivery of public services. And the Scottish Government is committed to making progress towards the shared COVID recovery strategy outcomes in partnership with local government and other partners, and will continue to prioritise spending which is targeted to support those in most need. Audrey Nicholl. Thank you. One of the priorities of the COVID recovery strategy is financial security for low-income households. Yet recent DWP figures uh, revealed poverty has risen in the UK, with the number of people in relative low income increasing by 1 million from 13.4 million in March 2021 to 14.4 million a year later. What assessment has the Scottish Government made of the impact of the Tory Government and Labour Party's continued obsession with Brexit 
on its ability to deliver on the strategy's priorities. Minister. Well, I'm sure the member will recall that the Scottish Government made representations, as did many people in Scotland, to the UK Government not to come out of Europe in the midst of the pandemic, because that would only compound the hardship that people were facing. And of course, now subsequently, we've got inflation and the cost of living crisis. But despite that, the Scottish Government continues to take action to support low-income households. We have increased the Scottish Child Payment to £25 per week, doubled the Fuel Insecurity Fund to £20 million, and provided local authorities with additional funding for discretionary housing payments. And that's just some of the actions that we have taken with our limited powers to help mitigate the detrimental impacts of Brexit and indeed the cost of living crisis. Brief supplementaries first, uh, Paul Sweeney. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Glasgow Centre for Population Health report on life expectancy highlighted that mortality rates have stalled since 2012, and the Scottish Government's recent health inequalities report found that the gap in health outcomes between the most and least deprived communities is the widest since monitoring began in 1997. So, can the Minister advise how the Government plan to tackle this unacceptable disparity in health outcomes between the best off and worst off in our communities, in line with their commitment to addressing systemic inequalities through the COVID recovery strategy? Minister. The member highlights some of the challenges we have faced in recent years, and he will be aware, of course, there have been many reports about the widening gap between rich and poor throughout the whole of the UK. This is not a unique issue in Scotland, largely down to austerity from the UK Government since 2010, compounded by Brexit, which Scotland didn't vote for. And, of course, as I said previously, there is the impact of the pandemic and the inflationary cost of living crisis uh, as well. Uh, therefore, many of these external factors are impacted on poverty in Scotland, which we do not have the full powers to address. And indeed, inflation, of course, has affected the Scottish budget, but there is a 4.8 per cent uh, reduction in the Scottish budget in real terms compared to 21-22, because the UK Government will not allocate money to Scotland to reflect inflation. So there's a number of issues that do need to be addressed, and, and I think we agree with the, the sentiments from the member, but we want this parliament to all the powers so we can address poverty in Scotland and the challenges of life expectancy in many parts of the country. And Douglas London. Thank you, President Officer. The COVID recovery strategy states the pandemic has highlighted the importance of our parks and libraries, particularly for those on low incomes. So will the Minister join me in condemning the SNP administration at Aberdeen City Council for closing six libraries? which will hit those on lower incomes hardest. Yeah. Minister. I don't know if the member was listening to my previous answer, where I explained that the UK Government have not allocated funding to Scotland to reflect the impact of inflation. And indeed, there is a 4.8 per cent real terms reduction in the Scottish budget. Uh, we have given a fair settlement to local government in the recent budget. And I don't know if his party put in alternatives to address some of the issues that he wanted addressed. But we do believe in local democracy, and it's for local decisions to be taken by local government in this country. So I'd urge him to make representations to his Conservative colleagues in the UK government to make sure we get a much better settlement in Scotland to help us support our local councils as well as central governments. Question three, Claire Adamson. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how its cross-government coordination of COVID recovery policies is addressing the needs of those affected by long COVID. Minister Marie Todd. The Scottish Government is supporting a recovery which is focused on supporting individuals and communities that were most affected during the pandemic, including those with long COVID, and reducing systemic inequalities across Scotland. The Scottish Government recognises the impact that long COVID can have on the health and well-being of those affected and is investing in its scientific efforts to understand long COVID. We have made an initial three million available to NHS boards and their partners to deliver the best local models of care for assessment and support for the ongoing management or treatment of symptoms. Claire Adamson. Thank you, the Minister, for her answer. Um, one of my um, other Wilmshire constituents who had a horrendous COVID experience and is suffering from long COVID is unable to get back to work as a pilot due to hearing loss. He has had one cochlear implant fitted following COVID complications, but this would not meet the requirements for his profession. Current NICE guidelines followed by Health Improvement Scotland stipulate that he must have another condition that impacts on cognitive ability to be eligible for a second bilateral implant. These guidelines are from 2019, before the pandemic. As part of COVID recovery, the Scottish Government commit to working across parliaments to review guidelines in place so that people like my constituents, made economically inactive due to long COVID, 
have their circumstances considered. Minister. Um, firstly, let me say I'm really sorry to hear about the impact that long COVID is having on your constituent. Um, Healthcare Improvement Scotland is a national improvement organisation and supports the health and social care system to design and provide high quality, sustainable and compassionate care for the people of Scotland. The National Institute for Health and Care Excellence NICE guidelines are developed by expert panels taking into account the relevant evidence. And in Scotland, SIGN, the Scottish Intercollegiate Guidelines Network gui guidelines, contain um, recommendations for effective practice based on current evidence. But NHS boards in Scotland can choose to consider other guidelines, such as NICE guidelines, where there is no current SIGN guidance. At present, I am not aware of any plans to review that NICE guideline. A number of colleagues that want uh, supplementaries, they appeal to be brief, both in the questions and the answers uh, stands. First, Sanders Gohani. Thank you, Minister. In November, Humza Yusuf wrote to me and outlined how much long COVID support funding was provided to each health board. And whilst I was happy to see a rollout of long COVID rehabilitation pathways, there remains a lack of dedicated long COVID clinics across Scotland. Will the Minister heed the call of health professionals like NHS Grampian Head of Health Intelligence Gillian Evans and provide dedicated long COVID clinics across Scotland? Minister. So the Member is aware that it is the role of NHS boards to develop and deliver the models of care that are most appropriate for their local population's needs. We are providing the resource to boards through our Long COVID Support Fund to enable them to do that. And initiatives being supported by the funding include key elements of that care um, that are also offered by long COVID assessment clinics elsewhere in the UK, including single point of access for assessment, coordinated support from services, and including physiotherapy and occupational therapy. The member will also be aware that the sign guidance, which was developed collegiately on a four-nation basis um, across these, um, the, the whole of the UK, um, says explicitly that a one-size-fits-all approach, such as long COVID clinics, um, is not appropriate for all areas. Jackie Bailey. As of May last year, NHS England had allocated £224 million to support the assessment and treatment of long COVID, with £90 million of this allocated in 22-23. Applying the Barnett formula to these figures would produce funding of £21.7 million in Scotland, yet the SNP Government has only provided less than half of that amount, despite the number of people with long COVID growing threefold. Can the Minister explain where are the missing millions? Minister. So the member will be aware that Long COVID Support Fund has targeted additional resource for NHS boards to further enhance the assessment and the support that they are already delivering for people with Long COVID across a range of services. In 2022-23, 18 billion of funding was provided for the health portfolio. That's a record level of frontline health spending in Scotland. It's £323 per person, which is 10.6% higher than in England. We engage with NHS boards on a regular basis regarding their capacity needs and will continue to do so in order to inform the allocation of the Long COVID Support Fund. Beatrice Wishart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Media reports of a new study show that one in 50 Scots have long COVID. On that basis, then, it could be estimated that around 460 people are living with long COVID in Shetland. What consideration will the Scottish Government give to providing specialist long COVID services in our rural and island areas? Minister. So one of the challenges we have is getting accurate data on long COVID prevalence, distribution and symptoms that are needed to forecast and plan NHS services and achieving that objective is complex, but we currently don't have the full picture. Um, the Scottish Government is happy to work very closely with NHS Shetland and any other board in order to help to provide information so that they can plan adequately for their local needs. But I'll emphasise, as I have in previous answers, it is for the local health boards to respond to the need in their communities and to ensure that services can deliver for the people that they serve. And briefly, Alec Rowley. Presiding officer, in England and Wales, the NHS have set up long COVID clinics and the evidence so far demonstrates that this is definitely the right way to proceed, ensuring that the individual goes first. Will the Minister agree to look at that evidence and come back to Parliament and state whether or not that is a way that, that Scotland can follow? Minister. 
So in Scotland, we follow the clinical guideline um, as referenced in an earlier answer, which exists for long COVID. It was developed rapidly, published by SIGN, NICE and RCGP in December 2020. That living guideline includes not only recommendations and guidance on the clinical management of those with long COVID, but recommendations for those who are planning services. And I reiterate, that guideline notes that one model would not fit all areas. However, it is perfectly possible for local health boards to come forward with a long COVID clinic model should they think that fits their local needs and that development of that model would absolutely be supported. Question four, Evelyn Tweed. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government, as part of its cross-government coordination of COVID recovery policies, what steps it is taking to ensure that the public has confidence in Scotland's response to any future pandemic? Minister Marie Todd. The Scottish Government has taken action to ensure that we are prepared for any future pandemic. For example, we are currently working on a Four Nations basis to review the countermeasures, the capabilities that are required to address new pandemic threats. And we retain stockpiles of consumables and pharmaceuticals to support a pandemic response in the event it is required. We are also engaging fully with the independent Scottish public inquiry into the handling of the pandemic in Scotland. And the 2023-24 Scottish Budget made provision for work to ensure preparedness, assessment and coordination of concurrent risk across Scottish Government. Evelyn Tweed. I thank the Minister for that answer. Revelations of lockdown parties and rule breaking in Downing Street have tarnished the UK Government's COVID response. A recent YouGov poll showed that 82 per cent of Scots believe that former Prime Minister Boris Johnson is dishonest. Given this, does the Minister have any concerns that his blatant disregard of the COVID rules will have dented public confidence on all government's planning for future pandemics? For which the Minister is responsible, Minister. So I thank the member for her question. I think it's a perfectly plausible theory, yes. But the Scottish Government, I want to put on record again, is very grateful for how people across Scotland responded during the pandemic. They supported their families and their communities as safely as possible during a very challenging time. We are working to ensure that we are prepared for any future pandemic and we will absolutely learn from our experiences during the COVID-19 pandemic to ensure that the public absolutely have confidence in the measures that will be taken by the Scottish Government. And supplementary, Murdo Fraser. Well, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Perhaps we can get back to the Scottish Government's responsibilities. Um, Recently, the National Clinical Director, Professor Jason Leach, indicated that it was his view that the Scottish Government might have gone too far in closing schools during uh, the COVID pandemic because of the negative impact there had been both on education and on young people's social development. Given that we are learning lessons for the future, does the Scottish Government agree with that analysis? Minister. So in terms of learning lessons for the future, that's a process that will continue for many years to come as we look back on this period in our history, which has been one of the most challenging periods globally in modern times. Undoubtedly, there will be reflection, but I think that your view is somewhat, I think the member's view is somewhat simplistic in suggesting that there was an option between causing harm and causing no harm. I think when I've heard Jason Leach elaborate on this subject, what he says very clearly is that we are not sure at the moment what the unknown <coughs> harms might have been from not taking measures. And I am absolutely certain that everybody in the situation of being decision makers made the best decisions they possibly could based on incomplete information at the time. Question number five is not allowed, so question six, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has for the COVID recovery and parliamentary business portfolio. Minister George Adam. Thank you very much, President Officer, and can I thank uh, Mr Stewart for his question. Uh, in order to answer the question, the allocation of ministerial portfolios is a matter for the First Minister. The Parliament is due to consider the appointment of ministers tomorrow, during which the First Minister will likely speak to his plans for portfolios across government. Alexander Stewart. I thank the Minister for that response. The COVID recovery portfolio has had its difficulties during its short existence. 
whether that be COVID vaccine passport scheme, which punished businesses, confused the public and cost taxpayers dearly, or the power grab bill that granted the Scottish Government permanent emergency powers. Therefore, can I ask the Minister how he expects the COVID-19 inquiry to evaluate the performance of this portfolio over the last two years? Minister. It is not for me to speculate on future inquiries, but in answer to some of the questions uh, that have been asked there, the Scottish Government's efforts and ambitions around COVID recovery have always focused on enhancing the well-being of children, young people and increasing financial security for low-income households, creating good green jobs and fair work and supporting the reform of our public services. These priorities are reflected in the 2023-24 Scottish Budget, which focuses on reducing child poverty, making progress towards net zero and ensuring public services are fiscally sustainable. And to answer everything else, uh, President Officer, the Scottish Government, led by our new First Minister, will determine how best to support the people and communities across Scotland. Question 7, Colin Beattie. To ask the Scottish Government what impact the UK Government's spring budget will have on implementing the COVID recovery strategy. Minister Tom Arthur. The UK Government's budget statement is another missed opportunity that has failed to tackle the cost of living crisis and provide the support that people in Scotland need. We have consistently called for the UK Government to provide additional support to people with the cost of living crisis. The Scottish Government has prioritised spending which support those who need it most guided in part by the principles of the COVID recovery strategy. The 2023-24 Scottish Budget provides funding which helps families, backs businesses and protects the delivery of public services. Colin Beattie. This week, the Chairman of the Office for Budget Responsibility compared the scale of the impact of Brexit on the UK economy to the same magnitude as the COVID pandemic and energy price crises. Would the Minister comment on what assessment the Scottish Government has made of this comparison or on how the ongoing effects of leaving the EU will impact on the delivery of the COVID recovery strategy? Minister. Presiding Officer, the OBR are forecasting the largest two-year fall in real living standards since ONS records started in the 1950s. This would mean that living standards in the UK by 2027-28 would still be around 0.5 per cent lower than pre-pandemic levels. The UK's decision to leave the EU, something which Scotland did not vote for, is forecast to reduce the UK's productivity by 4 per cent, and the UK's trade intensity is set to be 15 per cent lower in the long run. Despite these challenges, the Scottish Government will continue to prioritise spending, which is targeted to support those most in need and make progress towards the COVID recovery strategy outcomes. Question number eight, Emma Harper. To ask the Scottish Government whether it plans to propose the scheduling of time for a ministerial statement on the Green Jobs Workforce Academy. Minister George Adam. Thank you, President Officer, and I thank Emma Harper for the question. Since its launch in 2021, the Green Jobs Workforce Academy has been supporting people in green careers. The Scottish Government will publish an update to the Climate Emergency Skills Action Plan this year, setting out the next steps to deliver skills for a just transition. Proposals for government business uh, in Parliament, as always, are agreed by the Scottish Cabinet, subject to consideration by the Parliamentary Bureau and, in turn, approved by the Parliament. Emma Harper. Thank the Minister for that answer. Green skills are vital in Scotland's fight against the global climate emergency and in equipping our workforce with the skills of the future. I visited Borders College Hoyt campus last week, where they are teaching building to passive house standard, solar panels and heat pump installation and maintenance, and using emergency, emerging technologies like heat scanning and 3D printing. So, Can the Minister provide an update on how the Green Jobs Workforce Academy will help enhance this work and how it will support those living in Devries and Galloway and the Scottish Borders? Minister. Thank you, President Officer. The, the Heat and Building Strategy, published in 2021, sets out our vision for, by, for decarbonising the heat supply of Scotland's buildings. A skilled workforce in all areas of Scotland is central to the delivery of that strategy. We are already taking action to ensure the education skills system is provided, uh, providing individuals with the right skills and pathways into careers in green heat, including through Green Jobs Workforce Academy. And we will set out our next steps in the Climate Emergency Skills Action Plan update. 
Deputy Minister. That concludes portfolio questions on COVID-19 recovery and parliamentary business. We move now to portfolio questions on finance and the economy. Again, the uh, usual appeal for brevity in questions and in responses. Um, and anybody looking to ask a supplementary should press the request to speak button during the re relevant question. I call question one, Stephen Kerr. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to ensure value for money in government projects. Minister Tom Arthur. The Scottish Government is committed to managing taxpayers' money efficiently and effectively while delivering on its commitments. Accountable officers are responsible for ensuring that resources are utilised economically, efficiently and effectively. The Scottish Public Finance Manual, which applies to the Scottish Administration and bodies sponsored by the Scottish Government, sets out the framework for securing best value and value for money. This is underpinned by the utilisation of business cases and pre-expenditure assessments for significant projects. The Scottish Public Finance Manual also sets out our programme and project management principles, as well as guidance on procuring, monitoring and major investment projects. These are embedded in the project assurance processes, supplemented by a robust analysis of data to help drive value for money. Stephen Kerr. Grateful to see the Minister in his place and thank him for his reply. I'm not going to mention ferries and I'm not going to mention so-called free bicycles. But I'm going to mention an institution owed money by GFG Alliance, which collapsed last week. And I'm not referring to the Scottish Government, despite the evidence of the last chaotic weekend. So can I ask the Minister what assessment the Scottish Government has made of the UBS rescue of Credit Suisse on GFG Alliance's refinancing efforts and what impact UBS's takeover of Credit Suisse may have on GFG's operations in Scotland and GFG's ability to repay the loans made to it by the Scottish Government? Minister. Well, the member is absolutely correct to raise the important issue of the recent disturbing and destabilising developments in the international banking sector. I know that there has been, in unrelated areas, engagement from Scottish enterprise, particularly around the issues pertaining to the tech sector. On the specific points that he raises, I am not in a position to give him a detailed answer at this point. However, I will ensure that a written response is given to the member to provide him with an update. Supplementary, Willie Coffey. Thank you. The National Audit Office is reportedly warning the revised plans for HS2 Euston Terminus would cost almost £5 billion, and the trains aren't expected to run into Euston until 2041. That's 15 years late. Crossrail was late. The Elizabeth Line was billions over budget, too. Does the Minister share my view that we don't need to take lessons from the Tories who are wasting billions of pounds of public money in the hope that nobody in Scotland notices. I'm sorry, Mr Coffey, that's not relevant to this question. Question two, Colette Stevenson. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with the UK Government following the announcement of the UK Spring Budget. Minister Tom Arthur. My colleague John Swinney, the former Deputy First Minister, spoke with the Chief Secretary to the Treasury on the morning of the UK Spring Budget, having earlier written to the Chancellor setting out Scottish interests. The Spring Budget was a missed opportunity to lift families out of poverty, invest in their public services and help businesses. In addition, it was hugely disappointing that, despite earlier commitments given to the Scottish Government, the Spring Budget was silent on the carbon capture usage and storage Scottish cluster. As such, we wrote to the Prime Minister calling on a concrete timeline for the Scottish cluster. I can assure Parliament that I will be taking up these issues with the UK Government in the days and weeks ahead. I thank the Minister for that response. Instead of fixing the doctor's pension issue, the Chancellor increased the pension lifetime allowance across the board, resulting in a massive giveaway for the wealthiest people in society. Yet another example of Westminster's poor pensions policies. The UK has one of the lowest state pensions in Europe. High levels of pensioner poverty and the rise in pension age negatively impacts poorer people in Scotland. Does the Minister agree with me that, with control over pensions, this Parliament could make a system that works for the people of Scotland and that the only way to guarantee that is for Scotland to become independent? Minister for the responsibilities of the Scottish Government. Presiding officer, Colette Stevenson raises very important issues with regards to 
with regards to the decisions that are taken around pensions. The resolution Foundation has called the changes to the pension tax allowance, and I quote, an unneeded tax break for wealthy pension savers. They suggest that scrapping the lifetime allowance could cost around £1.2 billion, that the employment gains may be, in a quote, overstated, and the changes could even encourage some people to retire earlier. This is simply a tax break for high earners, while low-income households are left behind. So I do agree with Colette Stevenson that we need the pension system to meet the needs of all people in Scotland. And as with so many other issues, the needs of Scotland can be best addressed if this Parliament is in a position to do so. Question three, Michael Mann. To ask the Scottish Government what consideration it has given to the tax implications of pay awards currently being administered by local government. Minister Tom Arthur. The tax implications of pay awards, particularly relating to those agreed later in the financial year, are routinely discussed throughout pay negotiations with relevant parties. Employers are responsible for administering pay deals through their payroll operations. We understand that due to resource pressures, some local authorities may not be able to process payments before the end of the tax year. Any employee who is concerned about this issue should contact an employer and engage with His Majesty's Revenue and Customs. Michael Mara. Thank you. Thank you for the Minister for that answer. Last week, Tess reported that teachers in half of all Scotland's councils will not receive their back pay in the, to, until next financial year. That delay will prove costly in tax terms for teachers. During the pay campaign, President Officer, I heard from teachers who were barely managing to make ends meet. Some were even resorting to food banks. And it was this government who treated our teachers with disdain throughout a year-long pay dispute. And now teachers are having to pay the price for the tactics of delay and dither from this government. What advice does the Minister have to those people who are suffering as a result? Minister. Well, we have always sought to engage constructively with our trade union colleagues, and in doing so, we have delivered a pay settlement for Scottish teachers. I do recognise the issues that he raises pertaining to the report in TES last week. Of course, the matter of administration of payrolls is for the employer, in this case, the local authority. The Scottish Government is not in a position to intervene. However, we would, and I'm sure the Parliament would join the Government in encouraging and hoping for the local government to address these issues of payroll as quickly and in as timely a fashion as possible. Question number four, Willie Coffey. Um, uh, to ask the Scottish Government what its position is and whether Scotland's digital economy will benefit from the UK Government's revised digital strategy. Minister Richard Lockett. Well, we welcome any commitment by the UK Government to strengthen the UK's digital economy. We do believe that lessons can also be learned from our approach here in Scotland. Our digital strategy and the Scottish Tech Ecosystem Review um, advanced ambitious programmes of work, including £42 million to deliver our national tech scaler network, for which no equivalent exists elsewhere in Europe. And we also welcome work underway by the British Business Bank to create a new £150 million investment fund for Scotland to provide growth capital for high potential companies and will continue to work with them and the UK Government to boost our tech sector. Willie Coffey. Can I thank the Minister for that answer? As he will know, the digital single market uh, we were part of in Europe is worth £400 billion each year and provided access for Scottish companies to huge opportunities to develop their tech sectors. The UK Government's digital strategy does not make a single reference to establishing the promised digital single market in the UK, and its claims for growth in the tech sector in the UK are paltry in comparison. Can the Minister assure me that despite this significant barrier, we will continue to make every effort to grow and develop the tech sector here in Scotland and to provide the support to Scottish companies who wish to access European and international opportunities? in the digital and technology sectors? Minister. Uh, yes, I, I can give the member that assurance, and that's why back in 2020, Mark Loken was uh, commissioned by the then Cabinet Secretary for Finance and Economy to undertake his short-life review into how Scotland's technology sector can contribute to Scotland's economic recovery following the, the COVID pandemic, and that resulted in the Scottish Technology Ecosystem Review, which was an acclaimed industry-led blueprint for the growth of the Scottish tech sector. And, of course, uh, the loss of the digital single market at the time was uh, very regrettable and the European Parliament indeed estimated the potential gains of a digital single market could be in the range of 415 to 500 billion euros per year 
as a result of higher productivity due to faster flow of information, greater efficiency in traditional economic sectors and higher levels of e-commerce. At the time, our most recent analysis in Scotland suggested that it would provide a 1.9% boost to GDP in this country, equivalent to £2.9 billion. So it's an exceedingly important sector, and I hope the member can take assurance from the steps we have taken since to ensure the importance of the sector is recognised and supported. Question 5, Katie Clark. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will commit to carrying out a review of the use of public-private partnerships for public infrastructure projects. Minister Tom Arthur. We have been clear about our concerns around the flexibility and value for money offered by historic PFI contracts. That is why the Scottish Futures Trust is working in partnership with public bodies to realise contract management improvements, including rescoping services, sharing in insurance cost savings, and optimising risk transfer in legacy contracts. Katie Clark. As the Minister will be aware, even the UK Treasury are now describing public-private partnerships as inflexible, overly complex and a source of significant fiscal risk to government. But Scotland is still entering into versions of these types of arrangements. Will the Scottish Government stop such partnerships and commit to a model which puts quality, value for money and accountability at its heart? Minister. Well, we of course seek to put quality and, and value for money at the heart of all infrastructure projects that we engage upon. Um, I think it is important to recognise though that options are, that are available to the UK Government and indeed um, other sovereign governments are not available to the Scottish Government. For example, the significant capital borrowing powers that would allow for a different approach. So, as the member will, um, I'm sure, have reflected upon from our recent discussion around the future of our town centres and retail, there is much that the public sector can do, but there are also a need to make sure we are bringing in private investment as well. But we want to do so in a way that ensures the best value and best outcome. So, as I said, we are we have asked Scottish Futures Trust to undertake work in this area, looking at the legacy of PFI contracts. That is work that has been undertaken, and we are committed to engaging in a way that is constructive to ensure that all of our infrastructure projects deliver best value. Supplementary first, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In 2006, the North Ayrshire Council signed up to a public-private partnership deal to build four new schools with a capital cost of £81 million, to which the people of North Ayrshire will pay over £400 million in charges over three decades, with the financiers then owning the schools. Does the Minister agree that with a Labour-controlled council, Labour government at Westminster and a Labour-led administration at Holyrood when this shady deal was done, it's astonishing that the Labour MP at the time, Katie Clark, is now asking this SNP government to sort out a mess of her party's own making? Matters for which the Scottish <laughs> Government is responsible, Minister. It is a, a, and I'm, I'm very grateful to the member for his um, supplementary question. It is a, <laughs> an enduring frustration that we have to contend with the legacy of PFI contracts signed uh, by the previous administration, admittedly an administration that was last in power some 16 years ago. And what compounds that frustration is that at a time when there was a Labour government at Westminster and a Labour-led government here, there were access to resources, to capital powers, which simply are not available to this Parliament in isolation. Indeed, that was a time when Labour was routinely returning money allocated to the Scottish Parliament back to Westminster. So this is unfortunately a legacy that we have to contend with, but it's mistakes that we will not repeat. And Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The mismanagement of public infrastructure projects has a real consequences in communities on the ground. The Scottish Government's incompetence at leaving islanders without working ferries and leaving Highlanders with a lethal undual day nine. Infrastructure is not a priority for this Green SNP Government. So when will they start taking seriously the waste within their government and the desperation of the people of Scotland who have been so badly let down by them? Minister. Well, the um, member raises a lot of questions um, around infrastructure, and that's often something I reflect on 
when driving on the M8 completed under an SNP government, or on the M80 completed by an SNP government, or on the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route completed by an SNP government, or going across to the Queensferry Crossing completed by an SNP government, or riding on the Borders Railway completed by an SNP government, or enjoying the electrified line between Queen Street and Haymarket. Again, under an SNP government, and even recently, and I'd be delighted to see this completed, the electrified line between Barhead and my constituency in Glasgow Central. All examples of this SNP government delivering infrastructure for the people of Scotland. Thank you. I noticed that one member who asked a question earlier on in this portfolio has um, since left the chamber without an explanation. Can I just uh, um, remind the chamber that if you have a question, either on the order paper or as a supplementary, you are expected to remain in the chamber for the duration of that portfolio uh, question time. I now call question six, Willie Rennie. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its commitment to deliver superfast broadband to 100% of premises by 2021. Minister Richard Lockhead. As outlined just last month in response to the same question from Mr Rennie, all homes and businesses across Scotland had the ability to access a superfast broadband connection by the end of 2021. And I'm also pleased to announce that by the end of February 2023, the R100 contracts have built connections to over 20,000 properties across the length and breadth of Scotland, with almost 3,000 connections also delivered through the R100 vouchers. Willie Rennie. Yes, it was exactly the same question as last time. And it's exactly the same insulting answer as I got last time, because R100 has not been delivered, and the Minister fine well knows that. My home still doesn't have super-fast broadband, despite numerous attempts to get so. And thousands of other homes across the country haven't got it either, and many aren't going to get it until 2028. That's seven years late. Now, the First Minister said that he wants to reach across the chamber and bring transparency to government. So rather than reading out the official answer, will the minister tell me exactly what he really thinks? Richard Lott, minister. The member may wish to recall that the Scottish Government's very ambitious and huge commitment to this rollout was a result of a lack of action by the UK Government, who actually have responsibility for telecommunications. And at the moment, 95.4% of premises across Scotland are now able to access superfast broadband speeds. And in total, the Digital Scotland Superfast Broadband Scheme has connected 951,000 premises across Scotland to fibre broadband. And that includes 30,680 of these premises within the North East Fife constituency, with 28,368 capable of accessing speeds of 24 megabytes per second uh, and above. And I don't know whether the member himself has applied for the vouchers that are available um, and what conversations he's had with Openreach. I know that Openreach have actually connected people over above those in the contract as well. And work is continuing, of course, where particular issues have been come across in, in terms of the actual works themselves, which can take a bit longer in some cases than anticipated once the uh, Openreach are on the grounds. So that's fantastic progress that's been made by this uh, Scottish Government over the years, uh, plugging a gap that was left by the UK Government's inaction. And we should be very proud of what we've achieved in this country. And supplementary, Jamie Halker johnson The SNP's promised but delayed R100 broadband remains years away, and access to fast, reliable broadband is still a postcode lottery for many homes and businesses across my Highlands and Islands region. So what does the Minister say to my constituents, who, despite promises, repeated promises from this Scottish Government, are still waiting for a service which delivers even the most basics of what they need. Minister. Well, what I'd say to the member is the Scottish Government have been working flat out and invested over £600 million uh, in this due to the fact that despite telecommunications as reserved to the UK Government, for many years little, if any, action was taken by his own party's governments south of the border. So the 95% of households and businesses or premises in Scotland that now have access to superfast super speeds have benefited from the effort taken by this government. Yes, more does need to be done. I mentioned some of the, the physical barriers that have come across, but open reach still have to be addressed. And a, it's very complex in some parts of the country. I know that from my own constituency, which uh, the member will also be familiar with. And there are a number of homes where there are particular challenges 
They could, of course, in many cases, apply for the vouchers, but they, there's different choices they can take. And it's really important we continue to work to overcome those barriers to make sure that everyone in Scotland has the access to superfast broadband that they require. And briefly, Beatrice Wisher. Residents in Shetland and other island and rural areas face being left behind in the rollout of superfast broadband. One constituent who runs a business from home has been told she simply lives too far away to make a connection economical. Reliable internet is not a luxury and it's certainly not economical for her business. The Scottish Government is responsible for the rollout of superfast bro broadband, so when will all my constituents be able to get that? Minister. Well, I am aware that, of course, in, in Shetland there are particular challenges for those who are, are very far from the, the infrastructure, and it's important that those constituents are made available of what help it, are made aware of what help is available in terms of the vouchers. But it's really important that uh, Openreach uh, and, you know, obviously colleagues in the Scottish Government continue to focus on those that are the hardest to reach in Shetland. Uh, and I'm happy to ensure that she receives an update of the situation on the islands as soon as possible. Question seven, Sarah Boyer. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment is made of the potential lost taxation revenue from the proposed Land and Buildings Transaction Tax Green Freeports Relief, which were published for consultation on the 17th of March 2023. Minister Tom Arthur. Presiding officer, the Green Freeport LBTT relief will support the objective to encourage investment in and regeneration of underdeveloped land within clearly defined tax sites. The Scottish Government will set out further information on the potential cost of the relief at the time any legislation is laid before the Scottish Parliament. Sarah Boyant. Can I thank the Minister for that answer? The Minister may be aware that there is a concern from trade unions that this proposal could risk a race to the bottom on workers' rights and tax. So can the Minister provide an assurance today that workers in Leith and around the Forth will not see any of their rights weakened? And can he confirm whether all employers who receive public funding or tax incentives in Scottish green free ports will be required to recognise trade unions? Minister. Well, on, on the latter point, uh, if we, because of the reservations on employment law, we cannot compel recognition of trade unions. However, both of the successful bids have made clear commitments to fair work principles, and that will be subject to robust monitoring and reporting requirements. Question number eight, Daniel Johnson. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to address the reported second year of consecutive contraction in the number of businesses that are based in Scotland. Minister Tom Arthur. The latest statistics show that despite the challenging economic conditions, the total number of businesses in Scotland rose to 360,910 in 2022, a 5.2% increase on the previous year. However, we know businesses in Scotland are struggling because of Brexit and the UK Government's mismanagement of the economy. That is why the Scottish Government is doing all it can through our limited powers to provide immediate support to businesses, including the lowest non-domestic rates poundage in the UK. At the same time, we are delivering our national strategy for economic transformation to achieve our long-term ambitions for a stronger, fairer and greener economy. The activities we are delivering are supporting businesses, encouraging and cultivating new businesses and attracting more businesses to Scotland. We are working closely with delivery partners, businesses, the third sector and trade unions to successfully implement the strategy and transform our economy. Daniel Johnson. The reality is, is the figures show that Scotland is the only part of the UK with declining business numbers. But perhaps that is not surprising given that Kate Forbes and Ivan McKee were overruled forced to remove the very word growth from the national strategy for economic transformation. And now they themselves are removed, not just their words. So perhaps it's not surprising that speaking to the Herald today, Ivan McKee said it was frustrating having to talk to businesses every day without having the ability to do anything about it. And that's a quote. So can I ask the Minister, Ivan McKee is right. The government does need to reset its relationship with business, doesn't it? And in fact, is there anyone left on the government benches with any experience of actually running a business at all? Minister. Well, let me first of all commend my colleagues Kate Forbes and Ivan McKee for the tremendous service they have given to this government and the people of Scotland. <laughs> And they have certainly done more for business if it's in Scotland than any member of the opposition parties, let me say that, and I know they will continue to make a valuable contribution. 
We are absolutely committed to supporting business in Scotland and ensuring that in doing so we work together, collaboratively in partnership, to build a well-being economy that works for all people in Scotland. And that is a shame that that is something that the Labour Party can't commend and can't support, but it is something this Scottish SNP Green Government will be absolutely focused on and will deliver. We've got a couple of supplementaries. I intend to get them both in. They'll need to be brief, so all the responses. First, Colin Beattie. Considering the difficult economic circumstances, businesses need support right now to manage the pressures they're facing. However, as we well know, many of the powers needed to provide this support are currently reserved. Can the Minister provide any further information about what assessment has the Scottish Government made of the UK Government's spring budget in terms of the measures it includes to support businesses, and does he share my concern that it doesn't go far enough? Minister. Yes, we do, as I made reference to earlier on, we do agree that the UK Government's spring budget does not go far enough. It was a missed opportunity. And the reality is that this is not just a cost of living crisis, it is a cost of everything crisis. And it is impacting upon businesses, not just the length and breadth of Scotland, but across the UK. We are doing all we can with the limited powers we have in this Parliament. It's time the UK Government stepped up to the mark and did the same. And Ms Smith. Uh, Minister, when it comes to attracting more people to come to Scotland to work in Scotland, can I ask what analysis the Scottish Government is doing about why it is that we are not getting the benefit in as uh, great a detail as uh, down south when it comes to net migration? Why are not more people coming to work in Scotland? Minister. I, I recognise this is an area... Um, Ms Smith raised previously with the Deputy First Minister in the last few weeks. This is something that the Government is undertaking careful analysis of, and indeed we have our commitments to work to actively grow the population of Scotland. So of course we want to ensure that Scotland is the most attractive place, not just in the UK, but one of the most attractive places in Europe for people to come, to locate, to work, to contribute, to start up a business. But of course one of the challenges that we face, notwithstanding the points that Liz Smith made, is that that access that we had to a huge pool of labour, over 500 million people across the European Union has been lost to us, despite voting overwhelmingly to remain in the European Union, to enjoy freedom of movement, to enjoy the single market. That has been denied to us by the UK Government, and it is something we will regain with independence. Thank you, Minister. That concludes uh, portfolio questions on finance and the economy. It's time to move on to the next portfolio, which is net zero energy and transport. Again, there's quite a bit of interest, so questions Point of order, Colette Stevenson. Um, Deputy President Officer, um, can I apologise for leaving during the portfolio questions? I did have to take an urgent phone call, so I apologise to yourself and to the rest of the Chamber. Thank you very much indeed, Ms Stevenson, uh, for that explanation. I think it's worth clarifying that where um, a member does need to leave the Chamber um, at short notice, that is perfectly permissible, but it, um, I think I would advise members that they, they need to alert the Chair uh, to that. But thank you very much indeed, Ms Stevenson. Uh, with that, I would advise again members wishing to ask a supplementary question to press the request to speak buttons during the relevant question. And I call question number one, uh, Siobhan Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask the Scottish Government what measures it is taking to ensure that public transport is accessible? Minister Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'll be covering a number of questions uh, in place of the Transport Minister today. The Scottish Government is committed, of course, to ensuring that people with disabilities can travel with the same freedom, choice, dignity and opportunity as other citizens. Scotland's Accessible Travel Framework was launched in 2016, aiming to help achieve this. And there have been a, a number of delivery plans which have been developed uh, working together with disabled people's organisations and the Mobility and Access Committee for Scotland to provide a focus for action. The third delivery plan is currently being prepared. It will be published later this year and it will run uh, until the end of the current accessible travel framework in 2026. Siobhan Minister for the answer. I have a constituent who unfortunately lost her sight during COVID and can no longer drive, so relies on public transport. And she's been in touch as she really struggles to know what bus is coming along and where to get off the bus. Simple measures such as talking bus stops and onboard announcements would be helpful. Can I ask what measures the Scottish Government is taking to work with providers to make sure people with vision impairments are supported to use public transport? Minister. Well, I thank uh, Siobhan Brown for raising this uh, experience that her constituent and others uh, around Scotland have been having. Uh, bus travel, of course, should be accessible for all, and I agree 
uh, very strongly that accessible audiovisual information should be provided on bus routes. Uh, accessible information on bus routes, though, is reserved to the UK Government. Uh, it used the Bus Services Act 2016 to amend the Equality Act 2010 to require operators to provide uh, audio and visual information on board bus services uh, across Great Britain. In 2018, the UK Government uh, also consulted on proposals to improve information for bus passengers and my colleague Michael Matheson, uh, who at that time was Cabinet Secretary for Transport Infrastructure and Connectivity, responded to that consultation. Given the importance of ensuring clear and consistent information to all bus users, it is disappointing that the UK Government's proposed legislation has still to be introduced. Uh, I have noticed, however, that the Department for Transport has confirmed in a written answer earlier this year that it intends to introduce regulations uh, which will require the provision of audible and visible information on local bus and coach services across Great Britain. Uh, Transport Scotland's officials are continuing to engage with UK counterparts on this issue. Question two, Oliver Mundell. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it's taking to support the reopening of railway stations in Dumfrieshire. Minister Patrick Harvey. The Regional Transport Partnership, Swiss Trans, has undertaken three transport appraisals which have considered potential rail stations at Beatick, Eastrix and Thornhill in Dumfrieshire. Transport Scotland officials have engaged with Swiss Trans uh, on these uh, and will respond on the three appraisal reports in the coming weeks. Oliver Mundell. I, I thank the Minister for that answer. But along with campaigners, I'm disappointed that the proposed new stations weren't considered strategically important enough uh, to feature in STPR2. Following a recent cross-party visit coordinated by BTUC Station Action Group, I wonder if the Minister uh, would uh, sign the new Transport Minister uh, and, failing that, commit himself uh, to meet with myself, uh, Colin Smith, Emma Harper, as well as representatives of the different uh, campaign groups to better understand how these projects can now be taken forward and how we secure the funding to see them reopened. Minister. Uh, well, I'm sure that the, uh, the new Transport Minister will be keen to continue to engage on a cross-party basis with colleagues uh, about these issues. But as was discussed uh, on a number of issues when we uh, launched STPR2, uh, some members uh, may have been disappointed that uh, regional or locally very important projects were not considered uh, as part of the, the STPR2 process, which is about strategic national level uh, review. However, we've been clear throughout the process and since publication that there remain paths open for regional and local projects to come forward uh, and for consideration of business cases in relation to those uh, projects. Therefore, uh, officials uh, have begun reviewing the appraisals that were previously submitted uh, and, as I've said, officials are intending to respond on these within the coming weeks. Uh, I'm sure that the, the member will continue to engage with the new Transport Minister on that as well. Thank you. A couple of supplementaries. First, Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Does the Minister not accept that the real frustration, however, of communities? They were told new stations would be part of STPR2, then they were told they weren't. So it's not clear to me why there's been a delay in taking forward new stations if there were never going to be strategic projects as part of STPR2. He also says that the STAG report response will come from Transport Scotland in the weeks. That has been with Transport Scotland since last August. Why is it taking so long? And clearly, the Government haven't yet even allocated any funding for those pipeline projects. So can I ask the Minister just exactly how much funding is going to go towards new stations in the coming months and years? Minister. Uh, well, the Member will be aware that there has been substantial investment in rail infrastructure and is uh, substantial further investment to come, both in, in terms of uh, new lines and reopening uh, stations. I, I would have to remind the Member, though, that STPR2 uh, a whole Scotland review of uh, nationally strategic important uh, infrastructure uh, it generated over 13,500 uh, ideas, and so clearly not every uh, stakeholder or, or local campaign group would have seen their proposals included in STPR2. Uh, but uh, members, uh, for example, of the, the BTEC Station Action Group uh, will, uh, you know, as with other campaigns around uh, the country, be uh, owed significant praise for their work and their efforts uh, in support of their aims and other paths for the development of local and regional 
significant projects are uh, still open. So we will be coming forward with, uh, with work to uh, feedback to Swiss Trans uh, on these, uh, these issues. And uh, as with uh, Mr Mundell, I would encourage Mr Smith to engage with the new Transport Minister on these points. Thank you, Minister. I know you're trying to be uh, helpful, but a little bit more brevity in the responses would uh, help. I need to uh, get in a couple more supplementaries. First, Emma Harper. Um, thank you, President Officer. As uh, Oliver Mundell has intimated, we're all very interested in improving the infrastructure and the rail in Dumfries and Galloway and, uh, and for me also across South Scotland. Um, I'm just interested to know what the regional transport partnerships like Swiss Trans, what additional work can they do to help make the reopening of Beatit Railway Station for instance actually happen? Minister. Uh, well, certainly Emma Harper as well will want to engage with the, the new Transport Minister. I hope that members understand in today's context uh, I'm not able necessarily to uh, give a, as detailed an answer as the, the Transport Minister would be able to. But of the 45 uh, STPR2 recommendations, uh, 34 are applicable to south of Scotland. Uh, that includes a, a, a range of uh, port improvements as well as uh, the existing rail infrastructure uh, and uh, improvements to road that are focused on safety, resilience, reliability and climate change adaptation. And Sean Dowie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Despite the Government's commitment to improving transport links to encourage public transport use, the poor bus and rail connectivity in Ayrshire is still forcing drivers to remain on the roads. For example, Cumnock, East Ayrshire's second largest town, currently lacks a train station. What plans does the Minister have to improve public transport in Ayrshire, and would he give consideration to supporting the reopening of train stations in Cumnock and Mauchlin? Um, I appreciate there's a, a, some linkage, but the question was in relation to railway stations in Dumfriesshire. But if the Minister can add anything to what he's already said in response to the question. Um, I'd Presiding like to officer, I think the, the, the core answer in relation to uh, all areas is that the opportunities do exist for local and regional projects to come forward. Uh, Transport Scotland and the Scottish Government's officials are keen to engage with any constructive pro proposals that come forward. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure that the, the new Transport Minister will respond to all members who have expressed interest in this uh, as soon as possible. Thank you. Question number three, Ash Regan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will consider procuring a lower specification or uh, standardisation of ferries. Minister Patrick Harvey. Development of new vessels uh, is led by CMAL, uh, Transport Scotland and the relevant operator. CMAL appoints naval architects and technical consultants to advise on design, safety, classification, uh, as well as route-specific issues. Various hull forms, propulsion options, fuel types and onboard arrangements are assessed, and that also includes opportunity for input from community voices and other stakeholders. CMAL are aiming toward more standardised specifications as they continue to deliver the significant vessel investments in the coming years. And the four Isla-class vessels under construction and the ongoing work to develop the small vessel replacement programme are significant steps toward achieving this. I thank the Minister for that answer. Uh, the Minister will no doubt be aware that the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee have been undertaking a short inquiry on ferries at the moment. And the committee has heard substantial amount of evidence on over-specification and the relative expense of monohulls, and that for many routes, communities favour two smaller vessels instead of one large one. And that's for many reasons, but obviously to aid things like resilience, and that catamarans may be a more appropriate route to go down. So are alternatives to monohull, monohulls actively being considered, and which routes um, would be um, appropriate for these type of cheaper vessels? Minister. Yeah, I'm, I'm aware that um, some people have suggested that the government and CMAL uh, in particular have a, uh, a predisposition against the use of catamarans. Uh, I'd like to make it clear this is not the case. Uh, as stated, CMAL and Transport Scotland are looking uh, for the delivery of the most efficient and economic vessels that will reliably provide a service on the routes that they serve. And the Minister for Transport will update members further uh, on uh, future vessel contracts when that's possible. I've got a few supplementaries. I want to get them all in, but brief uh, questions, please, and responses. First, Rhoda Grant. 
presiding officer, vessels need to be fit for purpose and comfortable for both travellers and crew. However, the lack of standardised designs leads to a domino effect uh, to cover breakdowns. CalMAC have just today announced service, service changes over six routes due to a do domino effect culminating in no services at all between Loch Boisdale and Malig for six weeks and only one weekly service to the small isles. This is absolutely unacceptable. So will the minister say what the Scottish Government are going to do to mitigate those effects? And instead of vanity projects, will he ensure that they build ferries that are interchangeable, provide resilience and are fit for purpose? Minister. Uh, well, as, uh, as I said in the, the first answer, the development uh, of new vessels is led by CMAL as well as Transport Scotland and the relevant operators. Uh, and there is considerable debate and, and a number of factors that need to be considered uh, in relation to standardisation of, uh, uh, of uh, specifications. Uh, CalMAC uh, already, for example, are considering the, the debate about uh, live ashore and live on board models. Uh, that's just one of a number of, of factors that are uh, under active consideration. Uh, and uh, I hope uh, the, the member will once again acknowledge that the, the new transport minister, once appointed, uh, will be the person to engage with on some of the, the specific issues that she's raised. Briefly, Beatrice Wisher. What islanders need are sustainable, decarbonised, reliable ferries and, for some communities in Shetland, short tunnels between islands. Will the Minister listen to island community groups around Scotland to understand their needs? Minister. I am quite certain that the, the Government as a whole, as well as the new Transport Minister, will be keen to listen to community groups coming forward with those uh, proposals, as well as the views of the relevant local authorities. And briefly, Paul Sweeney. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. The problem is the CMAL has no mind for an industrial strategy, and that is a critical part of the problem. We need to have more funding beyond Halls 801 and 802 for Ferguson Marine. We need to have Scottish Government plans to do investment to meet the productivity standards set by First Money International. We need the Scottish Government to offer builders refund guarantees to win export work and commercial work, and we need the Scottish Government to award the small vessel replacement programme on a standardised basis, or the company Ferguson Marine will collapse. Does the Minister therefore agree that those fundamental principles need to be at the heart of this? strategy to get a sustainable shipbuilding industry in Scotland? Minister. Uh, I'm sure all of these issues and more will be at the forefront of the mind of the new Transport Minister. Question four, Ruth Maguire. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what community benefits citizens should expect from energy-related developments in their local area. Minister Richard Lockhead. Scottish communities received over £88 million in community benefits from renewable projects since 2019, with a record £25 million paid out last year. This will continue to rise as we realise our ambitions for growth over the coming decades. Our good practice principles promote the equivalent of £5,000 annually per installed megawatt for onshore developments index linked to the lifetime of the projects, although some businesses will choose to offer more flexible benefits packages. While we would prefer to mandate greater community benefits, we do of course have no direct powers to do so as energy regulation is reserved. Ruth McGuire. Thank the Minister for that answer. And while I appreciate that energy regulation is um, reserved, would he agree with me in principle that it might be time to consider updating some of that guidance so that it's not just companies that benefit from development, but those in the vicinity should see reductions of their energy costs so it's truly benefiting the communities that they're in? Minister. Yes, actually, I, I, I do agree with that. And I think right now we should all agree across the Chamber that the people of Scotland not just communities, but households, who should, should see much greater benefit from the energy resources on their own doorstep. And that issue is given a lot of profile in the current draft energy strategy and just transition plan that's out for consultation until early May. And there's a number of mentions of community benefit in that and the fact the government has an ambition to be much more radical uh, on that agenda. And I'd very much welcome the views of not only Ruth Maguire but members from across all the parties about how we can achieve that in Scotland. We do have limited ability because of the lack of energy regulation uh, devolved to this uh, Parliament. But if there's more we can do, we should absolutely do it. And people should see the benefits of the energy resources on their own doorsteps. Thank you again. A number of supplementaries. I want to get them all in. They'll need to be brief. Well, as so will the responses. First, Morris Golden. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Not every community is able to host a renewable project, and so not every community can receive those direct benefits. 
We need a system that allows everyone in Scotland, no matter where they live, to get a fair share of the rewards renewables can bring. That is why I have been calling for the introduction of a Scottish renewable energy bond for the past six years. Does the Minister agree it is time to look at this and ensure everyone has the chance to invest in and benefit from renewables? Minister. Uh, yes, I have a lot of sympathy for that. And indeed, I met an organisation and I was on the panel with uh, the chief executive of the organisation, I think it was called Ripple, uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And they encourage communities to take out shares in local energy projects. And I think there's a case for the whole of Scotland to be involved in such initiatives. Um, clearly, there's a lot of work to be done to make that happen. I think the member's nodding and agrees with that. But I do think we have to be a lot more radical and a lot more ambitious. The time is now, the time is right for that. And I would be very much in favour of a wholesale review of community benefit and shared ownership in Scotland. And there's many pointers to that in the draft uh, consultation at the moment. Thank you. Katie Clark. I welcome that Cumbria has been designated by the Scottish Government as one of the six islands that it will support to become fully carbon neutral by 2040. At the heart of the Carbon Neutrals Islands policy is the need for community engagement and benefit, yet there has been no consultation or engagement over the proposed solar farm development on the island. Will the Scottish Government call for this development to be paused until proper engagement has taken place with islanders? Minister. Um, I just returned from a wonderful weekend in Millport uh, just a couple of days ago, so um, I uh, am aware of uh, the strength of uh, the qualities of that part of the world, uh, particularly the local pubs and bars and hotels. Um, and I think the member again makes a very good point. But of course, as part of the just transition, it's very important that the future energy profile of any community is co-designed with the community's interests at heart and other factors, obviously, as well. So I'm happy to look into the, the matter the member raises, because I, I don't know the detail of what's happening locally there, really, uh, and get back to the member. Albeit, I may have to say that the relevant minister will get back to the member in due course. Thank you. And Mark Russell. Thanks. Uh, the repowering and extension of onshore wind farms is going to see a dramatic increase in capacity as we head towards that 20 gigawatts by 2030 target. Um, given the cost of wind generation has fallen dramatically over the years, does the Minister see an opportunity for communities to renegotiate some of those historic community benefit deals that still exist? And what support can the government give to communities to help to achieve that renegotiation? Briefly as possible, Minister. Well, again, I'll just say briefly, that's why there's uh, such a, a prominence given to the whole issue around community benefit in the draft energy strategy and just transition plan that's out at the moment. And yes, there should be a renegotiation where there's a case for that. Of course, there are voluntary agreements. And of course, we also have the Community and Renewable Energy Scheme, which is about shared ownership. And there's over 600 communities and locally owned projects throughout Scotland. Uh, and they've been offered funding of over £58 million. So, yes, I would be sympathetic to that kind of renegotiation. Thank you. Question number five, Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I refer members to my register of interests? To ask the Scottish Government what measures it has put in place to support island communities in advance of Hulls 801 and 802 and other ferries coming into service. Minister Patrick Harvey. While delivery of investments in new vessels and port infrastructure is being progressed, the Transport Minister has authorised the purchase and deployment of MB Loch Freezer, has chartered MB Arrow for overhaul and resilience cover, and recently agreed a nine-month charter of MB Alfred. Additional funding has been committed for enhanced maintenance of vessels, uh, and work with CMAL and the operators will be continued to identify potential additional second-hand tonnage to support the fleet. These measures, combined with our fare freeze, demonstrate that the Scottish Government is absolutely committed to improving the lifeline ferry fleet and better meeting the needs of island communities. Ministers, of course, like everybody else, fully appreciate the level of anger and disappointment uh, that some of the recent uh, issues in relation to lifeline ferry services have caused within these communities. Richard Leonard. Uh, well, can I thank the Minister for his response? And new ferry capacity is, of course, welcome, if long overdue. But the trouble is this. The latest solution chosen by the government, the MV Alfred, if it passes its birthing trials, will cost £9 million for a nine-month charter when it was bought outright for only £14 million. There are outstanding safety questions, 
following its grounding in the per per Pentland Firth last year, when at least six passengers were injured. And this catamaran is being time charted from an operator that refuses to recognise trade unions, whose crew are believed to be hired on terms and conditions significantly inferior to CalMac crews. No wonder last week the RMT accused the Scottish Government of adopting P&O style tactics through the back door. So what did the Government know of this? Can the Minister today give an undertaking that should the Envery Alfred see service, there will be value for public money, its crew will be employed on the same terms and conditions as CalMac crew, that they will be free to join a trade union, and that at all times the health and safety of both the public and the crew will be paramount? Minister. Thank you. The government takes extremely seriously the issues that Richard Leonard is rightly raising, and he's right to be concerned about them. Uh, of course, most people recognise that uh, while longer-term infrastructure is uh, coming uh, into place, the Charter uh, gives additional very important capacity, uh, and that's going to be extremely welcomed by most people who rely on the services. Uh, but the terms and conditions... Uh, for crews uh, under a charter uh, are a matter for the operators. CalMac has confirmed that they are receiving the living wage and Transport Scotland officials are monitoring the situation uh, and will keep the Transport Minister uh, appraised of any further action that's required. Again, a number of supplementaries. I want to get them uh, all in. We're going to go beyond time, but the questions will need to be brief and so will the responses. First, Emma Roddick. Thank you. I was delighted to hear of the charter of MV Alfred, and I think any measures to secure additional tonnage uh, for the fleet and improve the resilience of our lifeline ferry services is welcome and demonstrates the Scottish Government's commitment uh, to the communities which rely on them. Given that Alfred's design means that she can only operate at some ports, uh, can I ask the Minister where on the network this vessel may be deployed and what benefits the Government envisages its charter will bring? Briefly as possible, Minister. Uh, Emma Roddick is quite right to, to welcome the fact that this charter is now in place. The primary focus will be to support uh, resilience across the Clyde and Hebrides network. Uh, this should help to mitigate the impact of disruption or where islands are reduced to single vessel service. Berthing trials will be completed before the vessel enters service to confirm the routes on which it can operate with likely deployment on Arran and Isla. Uh, CalMac will be engaging with uh, community, uh, network community representatives over the next few weeks to discuss deployment options to support resilience across the network. And Graham Simpson. Thank you. Can the Minister say who it was agreed to pay £9 million to hire a ferry for nine months? Minister. Uh, I'm not able to provide a name. The Scottish Government uh, is responsible for the decision to charter the service, and I suspect that if we hadn't put that extra capacity in place, uh, we'd be getting an earful from uh, the member and others across the chamber for other reasons. And very briefly, Willie Rennie. It was once that ferries were just late and over budget, but now they're on fire, and we're paying £9 million for a nine-month contract. This is an outrage. The MV Alfred can't even run on all the routes. And the Minister hasn't answered the question, when will the islanders be told who will lose out this summer because of this government's incompetence? Minister. Uh, well, I have just uh, explained to the Chamber that uh, work will be ongoing with community representatives as well uh, to identify where uh, this additional capacity will be deployed. And I suspect most people who actually rely on the service will be glad that it's there. Question number six, Martin Whitfield. Very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met EDF and the Nuclear Industry Association regarding the future of Torness Nuclear Power Station. Minister Richard Lockhead. The Cabinet Secretary for Net Zero Energy and Transport met with EDF on the 16th of December 2021. At that meeting, the Cabinet Secretary met with EDF Generations Managing Director and their Head of Onshore Wind and Solar. At the meeting, EDF's decision to bring forward the closure of Torness Power Station was discussed. The Scottish Government has not met with the Nuclear Industries Association regarding the future of Torness Power Station. Martin Whitfield. I am very grateful to the Minister for that answer. And that we are now in 2023. Does he accept that Torness Nuclear Power Station has one of the lowest life cycle carbon emissions of any power plant in Scottish history? Minister. Well, if the member is making a point over the case as to whether or not it uh, should be closing, I should emphasise that the decision 
to bring forward the closure of Torness Power Station to 2028 was ultimately EDFs, and they made this decision based on a range of factors, including crucially the safety of the plant going forward. And, uh, of course, as the member will be aware, the Scottish Government doesn't support nuclear power in its current form uh, in Scotland and believe we have many other alternatives. But it's really important we support local workforces and the local community going forward uh, as the power station heads towards closure. And briefly, Brian Whittle. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I think the Minister knows that nuclear technology has advanced significantly since the last deployment of a nuclear power station in Scotland. Does the Minister not acknowledge the need for the Scottish Government to diversify its long-term energy strategy, and that should include consideration of these advances such as small modular nuclear reactors and research into nuclear fusion, or does the Humsa Yusuf administration content to be led by the Scottish Green policy based on ideology rather than science? Minister. It is really important to note that National Grid conducted a study of the impact of the earlier than expected closure of traditional nuclear generation in Scotland, which concluded that the energy system in the country would remain secure. And what we do know is, looking at Scotland's legacy of nuclear waste, this is a very expensive technology, it is a very dangerous technology. Even if we were to choose new nuclear power stations, it would take decades to build them in Scotland. We do not have decades to waste. We are facing a climate emergency. That is why Scotland should make the most of the abundance of renewable energy and green technologies we have on our own doorstep and have a clean, green, more affordable future. Question 7, Karen Adam. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with the UK Government regarding funding for carbon capture projects in Scotland. Minister Richard Lockett. There are regular discussions between the Scottish and UK Government on support for carbon capture and storage projects in Scotland. And indeed, I know this is very relevant to the member's constituency. That is why the UK spring budget was bitterly disappointing, as none of the £20 billion that was announced to support carbon capture and storage is for Scotland. Further delays are impacting both investor confidence and employment opportunities for up to 20,000 jobs, and is compromising both Scotland and the UK's ability to meet our climate obligations. The UK Government must, as a matter of absolute urgency, provide the Scottish cluster with the certainty it requires to move forward. Karen Adam. Thank you for that answer. For more than a decade, the Tory Government has promised carbon capture and storage to the people of the North East. And time and again, we have been overlooked. My constituency boasts great projects, including SSE's plans for new CCS station at Peterhead and the Acorn project. Today, the Times reported the UK Government had, at the last minute, moved an announcement tomorrow for further funding from Aberdeenshire to England. Will the Minister join me in calling on the UK Government to finally get behind the Scottish cluster? Minister. Yes, I do join the member um, on calling on the UK Government to get behind the Scottish cluster. And I remember Sir Ian Wood saying that the previous announcements missing out and snubbing Scotland's project was like a football team leaving their best player on the bench. What we have found is that the UK Government are very good at briefing the press about their intentions, but have still not had the courtesy to share their plans with the Scottish Government. And UK officials, of course, requested their meetings with their officials on Monday, but provided no details beyond what they had already briefed to the media. So the Scottish Government absolutely backs the Member's call for funding of ACORN and the Scottish Cluster to be included in the upcoming announcement, and it is vitally important to meet Scotland's climate emission targets and to achieve net zero by 2045, and, as I said before, to secure the future of up to 20,000 jobs. Briefly, Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. So, whilst the UK Government has put over £41 million of funding into supporting the Scottish Cluster so far, precisely how much of the £80 million the Scottish Government promised to put in in February 2022 has actually been paid over, Richard. As briefly as possible, Minister. Well, due to lack of support from the UK Government, the Scottish Government have made available an offer to progress the project in Scotland. And I can't believe a, the, a member of the Conservative Party whose government are holding up this project has got the audacity to stand up and criticise the Scottish Government on it. We are losing out on 20,000 jobs. Can I ask the member to please make representations to his masters in London to press the green light and allow this project to go ahead in Scotland? And question eight, Faisal Chowdhury. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it next plans to meet with all parties involved in the proposed Winchborough train station development. Minister Patrick Harvey. 
Uh, the member may be aware that Transport Scotland is supportive of the proposal for a developer-funded station at Wenchborough. The Transport Minister met with Wenchborough Developments Limited, as well as with Fiona Hislop MSP, Transport Scotland, Network Rail and West Lothian Council on the 6th of December uh, to discuss progress in developing plans for the new station. Network Rail uh, has been working on an estimate for the next stage of station design development, and uh, that's been handed over to Transport Scotland just this week. Uh, I anticipate further meetings will then be scheduled once that detailed estimate has been reviewed. Foisal Chowdhury. I, th I thank the Minister for the answer. Uh, Winchborough has been promoted as a commuter town for the city of Edinburgh and uh, the estimate population forecast of Winchborough in the next eight years is 13,000. A train station with a direct link to Edinburgh would provide a public transport links for Winchborough's growing population. Currently, with only the possibility of motorway exit, residents have no choice but to commute with cars. A train station in Winchborough would directly contribute to the Scottish Government's net zero target and elevate traffic congestion within Edinburgh. Can the Minister advise why the Scottish Government have not taken advantage of this opportunity to meet with net zero target and give residents the opportunity to opt out of private transport? And as briefly as possible, Minister. Well, the, the members' arguments uh, are indeed the reason why the Scottish Government, uh, is, uh, as well as Transport Scotland, is supportive of the proposals for a, uh, a station, just as we've seen uh, additional communities reconnected uh, to the rail network, including stations at Conan Bridge, Rob Royston, Kintore, Reston, uh, Inverness Airport. And over the next two years, new stations at East Linton, Cameron Bridge and Leven will also open. So I think there is a clear demonstration of the Scottish Government and Transport Scotland's commitment uh, to reconnecting as many communities as possible to the rail network. And that will include newly growing communities uh, like that at Winchborough. Thank you very much, Minister. That concludes portfolio questions. There will be a brief pause before we move on to the next item of business, which is a members' debate uh, to allow uh, front benches to change. Thank you.